Hello everybody and welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Fourier Transform and the difference between time and frequency. I hope everybody's well out there and I hope this will be educational. There's a lot of fairly nasty ugly math in this lecture and no fun audio. I apologize for that but it's really the nature of the beast. You really need to get your head around the time domain, the frequency domain, and the relationship between those two domains to be able to do audio stuff. So that's our plan for today is to try to do that. So a thing I've been saying for a long time now is that most sounds are periodic. They repeat over time. If you look at the pressure waveform, they are in fact waves it isn't random pressure changes, it's pressure changes that happen over and over again pretty much the same way. And what Fourier's theorem says, Fourier being one of the most common uh, pronunciations I've heard all different kinds in the business. But I'm gonna say Fourier's theorem says that an infinitely repeating sound can be represented as a sum of sinusoids. So we've mentioned this a bunch of times, this idea that if it repeats, you can add up a bunch of sinusoids with various amplitudes and phases to get the same repeating sound. And as we've said before as well, if you look at what the ear does, it takes those um, sinusoids and decomposes them, you know, decomposes this pressure wave into a sum of sinusoids. It tries really hard to figure it out. And that model that's physically built into the ear is part of the reason why this is so important. But we're starting with PCM. We're starting with a sequence over, of samples over time. There's no obvious representation of frequency in there anywhere. You say, well, the pressure's this now, then the pressure's this now, then the pressure's this now. And that's not obviously a frequency domain anything. And, you know, we've talked about the Nyquist limit quite a bit and the idea that the highest frequency that can be represented in a signal is half the sampling rate. And that's a weird idea because it isn't obvious that why that relation is a relation, right? You sort of think of, can think of the Nyquist limit as measuring somehow how fast a signal can change over time while you can still detect it. But what does it have to do with frequency? So this lecture, which will be short but fairly intense, is going to try to clear up some of the basics of thinking of time and frequency as interrelated things. So let's start with we have a continuous function, f of time. That's our sound pressure function. We got, you know, the Fourier transform is used in a lot of things, but we're going to use it to talk about audio, to talk about sound pressure. And certainly you can think of your microphone is spitting out some voltage that sort of is a analog representation of a sound pressure. That sound pressure changes over time. No big deal. And every at any specific time, the microphone is putting out at a specific voltage. What we really want to do is to understand what frequencies are there. So we take this signal, which is over time, and instead we'd like to know, well, what frequencies is this signal made up of? And that, that question, as we'll see later, only makes sense because we assume the signal repeats. And so if I look over the whole long, the whole life of the signal, then time sort of goes away. I don't need to think about how the signal varies over time anymore. I just need to think of what the frequencies it's composed of are and what their amplitudes are and their phases are. And if I know the amplitudes and phases of the sine waves that make up this repeating signal, then I could, in principle, perfectly reproduce the signal by just doing the math, right? Taking these all these sinusoids and adding them up to get the actual pressure at a given time. And the first thing, as I said, um, amplitude and phase, right? What's the phase of a sinusoid? Well, it's sort of the offset, right? Uh, a, sine with, a sine wave with zero phase starts at time zero at value zero because the sine of zero is zero. But you might add a sort of an offset between zero and two pi called the phase. 
to that sinusoid to make it start in a different place. Um, but we only have one function. It needs to represent both amplitude and frequency. And so the first trick that the DSP people use, which turns out to be a more convenient trick than even than you might realize, you know, we're computer scientists, we'd probably just use a two tuple or something like that. But for mathematicians, one way to sort of capture the combination of frequency and phase is to say, well, we'll use a complex number because a complex number effectively encodes two real numbers, right? If I have some, um, some real part and some imaginary part where I here is the square root of negative one, notice that J is also the square root of negative one a lot of times because engineering and math sometimes use different conventions for the same number. But anyway, if I have some complex number, then I can sort of think of the magnitude of that number as being the norm, the Euclidean norm. I, you know, where the minus sign here takes into account the fact that b is negative, right? So if I take a squared plus minus b squared, uh, that sort of given that i squared is minus one is sort of exactly the Euclidean length of a vector, right? So we're starting to think of these things as vectors that have a length and then they have an angle. Um, and the angle again is just trigonometry from one point of view. Uh, the arctangent of sort of the distance in the real part and this is the complex part. So you can sort of think of this vector as sort of pointing somewhere in space. and and one of the things we're going to do right away is we're going to say, well, F here is frequency in hertz, in cycles per second. It turns out a lot of the time, because we think of the sinusoid as sort of talking about phase angles, it's going to be more convenient to sort of throw in a factor of 2 pi and talk about omega, the angular frequency of a signal. And that's frustrating because now already you're trying, you're starting to drown in units, but that's how we do it. So the next thing to appreciate is Euler's very, very famous formula, which says, well, really you can think of complex exponentiation in terms of sines and cosines. If I take, you know, E and raise it to the ith power times omega t plus theta, right, you can sort of see here that omega is the angular frequency of the signal and theta is the phase of the signal. And sure enough, it's going to fall apart into a cosine wave in the real part and a sine wave in the imaginary part, both with the given angular frequency and the given phase. And by the way, we can sort of write down the this obviously also can be written down here as sort of putting the phase on the side. We multiply by the phase. Uh, so that's nice sometimes because if the phase is fixed, you can just treat it as a constant and throw it away or whatever. Um, so you'll a lot of times just see the e to the i omega t, but really the phase matters. Really phases sometimes matter in audio, sometimes don't. See, the ear doesn't directly hear phases. There's nothing in that mechanism we described earlier that says, you know, what phase a wave's coming in. It's not even very well defined. You, the phase depends on the starting time and there's no well-defined starting time for a repeating signal. But what matters is the relative phase of various sinusoids. You'll get a very different shape depending on how they're offset from each other. And so uh, for that reason, we kind of pay attention to phase a little bit. And so now, instead of our sinusoids that we were going to work with, we're going to work with complex exponentials for a bit and think about the Fourier theorem. The Fourier theorem says that every function of time can be represented as a function of frequency. The little hat there just is the I'm in the frequency domain hat over the F. And that's backwards, obviously. The, the, I need to fix those notes. We think of the second kind of thing as in the frequency domain. We think of the first kind of thing as in the time domain. And 
if I have a single frequency, then sort of I can think of it as, you know, sort of that should be f of omega. Wow, these notes are messed up. But at any rate, um, we can sort of think that if we have a frequency omega, uh, f of omega is what it should say here, then we can go ahead and exponentiate and run over time, and that gives us sort of the shape of the thing over time. But the other thing isn't obvious, right? If we start with this and want to go backwards to f of t, like this equation shows, then eh, that seems really complicated. And so the genius of Fourier, a mathematician, if I recall correctly, in the late Renaissance, was sort of understanding that one way to think about this is, what if I just take the time domain signal and multiply it by sine waves sort of integrated over all the time? So, um, so I get this time domain signal on the inside. I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the evolution over time. So each each point on this integral sort of represents uh, you know one point in time on this function. And so this is a function from a signal over time to a signal over frequency. That much is clear just because of the units. But and notice that it what it says is that we're going to sort of notionally combine, uh, sort of measure each frequency's correlation, each frequency's multiplication with our signal. And the amplitude of that is going to give me the sort of amplitude at that frequency in the frequency domain. And so we have this weird infinite integral over an infinite signal. That's eh, a little troubling. Uh, you got to watch out for that minus sign in the exponent there. That that thing disappears all the time. People are not careful. Um, but still, we can sort of see here, and I'm not going to prove this. I'm going to tell you this is how this works. Um, you can look at this fine Wikipedia page on the Fourier transform if you want to understand why it is that this happens a little bit. I'll also link some videos late further on down. But, you know, I said for a single sinusoid, it's easy to go the other way. You basically just plot the sinusoid over time. But if you have a bunch of them mixed together, it turns out this same kind of integral does the trick. We take our frequency and multiply by, you know, and get a sine and cosine wave with that frequency. And um, there's this fiddle factor of 2 pi here, which is sort of the inverse of the frequency that sorry is because the frequency is measured in radians and so to go once around is sort of 2 pi and so the transform isn't quite self inverse now I should be really clear in different books this is written different ways in some texts you'll see the 2 pi stuck somewhere else or have various other coefficients floating around but this is a pretty standard way to do it the important idea here is that we have this thing that converts between a signal represented as a bunch of frequencies and a signal that represented as a bunch of time points. And what we're going to do, and you know, there's the problem is there's some fiddly things about this. It's an infinite integral, which means that in practice, as an engineer, I'm not super satisfied. I don't know how to integrate over an infinite domain. Uh, the similarly, these functions sort of have infinite range. I mean, there's a bunch of things. This time domain signal is sort of notionally over an infinite interval of time. And so, yeah, not so great. But that's the fundamental idea. And what we're going to do in the next lecture is actually tackle uh, understanding how that discretizes, how we can build something out of this very abstract looking mathematical idea that we can actually implement as a computer program. So we're going to look at something called the discrete Fourier transform, and that's going to be the thing that sort of carries us into the domain of actually processing audio. So thanks. I hope that was helpful.
Hope everybody's staying safe out there, and I will talk to you again soon.